make sure you can hear me. Morning, everybody. Can I make sure you can hear me? Is that coming through loud and clear? Yes, good, okay. Great, so what I'd like to do in the next 25 minutes is invite two colleagues onto the stage um, that represent two programs over and above the wonderful um, Genomics England experience. And it would be great, please, Brian and Jean-Francois, if you could join me on the stage. And we're not going to use slides, but what we're going to do is, is have a discussion and a dialogue around these two programs, um, the role that Brian and Jean-Francois play in those, and we'll have a discussion that hopefully will uncover some of the insights around what makes those kind of programs successful, maybe have some comparisons with Genomics England, and, uh, and we'll take the dialogue from there over the next 25 minutes. So please, let's, let's grab a seat. So just in terms of an initial introduction, Brian, could I ask you to just um, explain the, your role, who you are, and maybe just a, a brief summary of the Saudi Genome Project that you've been involved with for a number of years now. The one thing I would emphasize, obviously, the, in the audience here, we've got some real specialists around the genomic space, but also some people who, you know, maybe genomics is a, is a word they don't fully understand. So just the idea of uh, explaining where the, where the program came from and the role that you play in it would be, would be invaluable. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, good morning, Paul and uh, Jean-Francois. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to thank Your Excellencies and the Dubai Health Forum for giving us this opportunity to prevent the, the Saudi Human Genome Program. Uh, my name is Brian Mayer. I'm the Chairman of the Department of Genetics uh, at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I've been there for 25 years and have been working in the area of genetics. And through the affiliation with the King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology, some, uh, in, in 2014, the Saudi Human Genome Program was launched. And as a, a scientist with 25 years of experience in the area, uh, it was a joy to be part of that program, which I think we'll discuss further this morning. Thank you, Brian. And could I ask you, Jean-Francois, to yeah. give a brief introduction? So can you hear me well? Yes, yes that's okay. we can hear. So, uh, hello everyone. So, first of all, thanks the organizer, you know, for the invitation. It's always a, a big pleasure to come to Dubai. Uh, so, my name is Jean-Francois Deleuze. I'm French, as you can probably hear. So, I'm running the Center for National Genomic in France, which is mostly working on um, human disease, human diversity. And um, the French plan uh, was a bit, you know, uh, later than uh, the Saudi one in 2014. So, we started in 2015. And it was a very, very um, top-down government plan uh, that we will be able to talk about. And I'm running, you know, the R&D part of this plan. Thank you, jean -Fran. And my, my name is Paul Jones. As was said in the introduction, I work for Illumina and I run the population genomics program um, in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So we're focused around supporting programs like the one at GEL that I was intimately involved in with Sir John, working for Sir John for a, for a number of years prior to joining Illumina. Um, and have liaised with the gentleman sitting by the side with, of me in terms of the role that companies like mine can play in supporting these, these kind of agendas. So, Brian, can I ask you, just give us a, a snapshot of what is the Saudi Genome Project? What, what are its goals, and how have you gone about doing what you're planning to do? So, so I think the, uh, the Saudi Human Genome Program has, uh, has common goals with other genome programs in, in the world, and that is to uh, leverage the... Uh, the technological advances in, uh, in genomics to improve the health of the population. A and I think uh, with the Saudi Human Genome Program, one difference to, to other genome programs, at least in the initial phase, was that given the unique nature of uh, healthcare problems within the region, uh, we decided to focus first on rare inherited disorders. Uh, uh, as Paul and uh, Jean Francois, you know, uh, uh, there's a high level of consanguinity within the Arab world. And this means a higher incidence of rare diseases. And so, uh, with the knowledge that, that our sequencing effort was going to be, uh, I guess, somewhat limited at the, uh, at the beginning, we chose to sort of work on this particular area where a limited amount of sequencing would actually deliver results back into the population very quickly. And, and so, I think by working with rare diseases, by developing uh, panels and exome sequencing first, uh, rather than progressing to whole genome sequencing, which we are doing very successfully with uh, uh, the likes of Illumina at the moment, uh, we were able to generate results that explained a lot of the rare diseases that are seen within the Arab world. Uh, with that information, it progressed rapidly into diagnostics. We have a very large uh, uh, diagnostic program going now. Uh, we were able to solve uh, some 40 to 60% of cases uh, based on the, on the sequencing that we've done. With that knowledge, 
uh, knowing uh, mutations that are present within the Arab world, uh, we are now uh, able to implement a preventative program uh, to screen people prior to marriage and to advise them of any mutations that they carry that will prevent disease in the future. And the economic and social impact of that is enormous. And I think that early success is driving our genome program towards studying, uh, now moving into oncology and pharmacogenetics, which I think are the next uh, areas that will uh, be translated into healthcare very quickly, and then progressing to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, where I think there is going to be more sequencing and more effort before we see results in the population. And Brian, when you set out, did you have very clear goals of having a clinical impact right from the very beginning, or has that emerged over time, that, that the relevance and impact you can, you can have? No, absolutely. You know, we, 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 we actually saw that in order to get investment in the programs, uh, that we needed to deliver something back to the community. So our target right from the outset was to try and understand rare diseases. To, we also sort of understood that the mutations in the Arab world the Arab population has been relatively poorly represented in genomic databases. And so to be able to service the Arab world with these new technologies, it was essential that we uh, generated research within the area. And in order to fund and drive that research, I think showing success in the population was extremely important. So yes, that was our strategy right from the start. And what kind of size and scale are you talking about, and, and over how many different centers? How, what's the, what's the, the, the basis of how the programs right. operated? So, so we also set a target of, of sequencing 100,000 samples. But, but from within those 100,000 samples, the idea was to try and understand the cause of many of the diseases. And the first 30,000 or so of samples were from individuals with rare diseases or, or family members. And in that context, in some instances, a more conserved sequencing approach was still able to deliver the, the results that we, uh, the, the, that we wanted. So, 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 you know, again, I think this was a, a unique approach that we used within the Saudi population that delivered results very, very, very quickly. The information that we have is obviously extremely important for diagnostics. It's also led to a prevention program and preventing these diseases, rare diseases, one, the lifetime healthcare cost of one affected individual with a rare disease is somewhere in the order of 1.5 million to 10 million US dollars. So even at the very conservative end, by doing premarital screening in a population where there are up to 150,000 marriages each year, can result in annual savings of some 3.8 billion rials or over a billion dollars a year. And I think when you can generate that kind of savings in your healthcare through genomics, it really means that one can invest in the future of looking at diseases such as oncology, pharmacogenetics, uh, and then eventually moving to diabetes and more common disorders. But so that's, a, that's a phenomenally powerful absolutely. case that can be made. W were you making that case at the outset, or has that emerged as you've progressed with the success of the program no, and the no, kind of numbers you know, we you're were, about? We were very aware of uh, uh, the potential for this, because once again, uh, I think people within the healthcare industry in the Arab world understand uh, how much impact some of these rare diseases have on families, what the incidence of the rare, those rare diseases are. We've been running many programs in, uh, in, in newborn screening, for instance, you know, which also gives you some idea of the incidence of rare diseases. Uh, in metabolic disorders, for instance, uh, globally, you may find one in three to one in 5,000 individuals with a rare metabolic disease. Uh, in Saudi Arabia or in the Arab world, I think this figure is somewhere around about 1 in 750 to 1 in 1,000. So the need to address this problem was very apparent even at the outset of the program and didn't just develop as part of the program. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Jean-Francois, can I ask you the same question? What, what is the French program? What role do you play in it? And what, what, what's the scope <coughs> and, and where, where exactly you are on that, on that journey? Yeah, yeah. So the French problem, by the way, is, is, is sharing common goals with what Brian is saying. But, you know, from what you say, I uh, really just reinforce what I'm thinking is that it is very specific because then it's going to be each very specific in each and every country for medical reasons, the one you mentioned, which, is, which are you know, linked to uh, the way people behave and live, for ethical reasons, for cultural reasons, and so on. So there will be not a, a single one genomic plan. There will be genomic plan adapted you know, to each country. So the one in France is started in 2015, and it's really uh, to give equal treatment to everyone. It's about you know, uh, 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 trying to solve you know, the many 
medical challenges that we have. We also are very concerned with uh, uh, rare disease, not exactly for the same reason. We have lesser rate of consanguinity in France than probably there is in the Arabic world, but we still have uh, uh, probably uh, 4,000 uh, uh, rare disease you know, running into France, in, and probably at, at the end of the day, it's million people, million, million, million patients. But the French plan, it's not a research plan, which is probably one of the most clinical plans of all the plans in the world. From the beginning, it is a health care plan. It's really putting sequencer into the hospital, no more into the labs, and, and trying to provide sequencing facility, whole genome, exome, rna seq and everything, to each and every patient. So, but we want to make the, because in France, we are lucky enough to be reimbursed for what we do, we want to demonstrate to the government there is a value in doing that. An economical value, as you say, but also a value for the patient. And, and uh, for that, everything is, uh, so we started with four pilot projects, one in rare disease, in intellectual disability, one in cancer, colorectal cancer and sarcoma. We also sequence the general population exactly as you do, because you, know, and you, you need to compare the sequence of a patient with regard to, the, to a, control, a control sample from the same ethnic origin. If not, you will be totally mislaid and you will, you will not find the genomic reason of the disease. And we also want to look at some common disease and we started with diabetes, diabetes type 2. Uh, so altogether, the plan is around, uh, it's very ambitious, because we want to do uh, 200, uh, it's probably, it will be at full speed in 2023, 2025, and, and at this time we want to sequence 200,000 genomes per year. It's, it's what is needed in France to uh, face the problem we have with oncology patients with no, no treatment, nothing, no surgery, no zero solution, and also to cover the need of the, of the rare disease population that we estimate being 60,000 samples per year. So to do that, again, France is a, is a, is a specific country, we, we took a, a slightly different um, position than the one in the UK. We will build 12 centers, uh, not only one center, because you know, we want, first of all, to cover the world population, but we also want to embark all the hospital. If we, did, if we do one, only one center in France, you know, in, in the middle of Paris, for example, the people elsewhere will not provide their patients to this facility no more. So we need to embark all the stakeholders uh, into the system so everyone feels to be part of the game. So uh, we have started to build the two first platforms, one in Paris, one in Lyon. Each will have a capacity of 20,000 genomes per year. And the tw 10 hours of, so at the end of the day, we will have 12 platforms all around the country, spread around the country. And the other one will, will be, will be uh, built uh, in the next two to three years. And all together, the government will put uh, a few hundred million euros, between 600 and 700 million euros on the table. And we believe that normally for each euro brought by, by the government, we will try to find one euro brought by industry, because this type of program will never work without the support of industry. And, that, and making the case for funding to the government, how easy has that been? It, it was difficult, so the, the only advice I could give is, we discussed three years only with academic people and it went nowhere. And then at some point, you know, we go to the government, and the, like in the UK, you know, the first minister, you know, just knock on the table and say, you have to do it, just do it. So, so then, you know, once it has been endorsed by the government, it was a bit more easy. Uh, to get funding by the government. But again, you know, there is a kind of deal. You know, we need also to embark industry uh, to help them into the system because it's going to be a billion, a billion euro program at the end of the day. Very good. Brian, can I ask you, w w what's your vision of where this is going? W w w w and when are we going to get there? <clears throat> you, you know, I think the case that we've developed, uh, particularly with respect to, to funding and impact and et cetera, is, is extremely compelling. I, I, think, I think the answers that we've had with rare diseases, the differences that we found in, in Arab ethnicities as opposed to what's present in the other databases uh, are, are, are actually uh, now exciting people with respect to being able to, to make diagnoses for families that go from one clinic to the next clinic for years. Now these diagnoses are, are happening very quickly. Uh, we have neonates in, uh, in ICUs that we, we, we do sequencing in, in 24 to 36 hours. We find a solution before that patient has been in that ICU for uh, 30 days. Uh, uh, some of these decisions that are coming out are the difference between a child re receiving a liver transplant or some other form of treatment. So, you know, the compelling nature and the translation into actual health care means that the support that we're getting is extremely strong. The information that we've got from this genome program that shows that some of the variants that we find within the Arab world that are thought to be pathogenic in other populations are in fact just common variation. Mm -hmm. It shows you the importance of doing this research in this population and the Arab world has not been represented 
in the genomics databases of other countries. So, so I, I, I see a tremendous excitement that came out of being able to solve rare diseases that is now driving into pharmacogenetics, and we know the impact that pharmacogenetic testing can have in terms of uh, the amount of time people spend in hospitals, the, the efficacy of their treatment, etc. Uh, there is a lot of economic cost savings and better, more efficient treatment that comes from that. And of course, oncology is this huge area that uh, I, I think to be able to, to profile tumors. In, in Saudi Arabia, we have, I think, about 12,000 new cancers every year. And a target would be to sequence every one of those cancers, to be able to provide opportunities for targeted therapies, uh, to be able to offer people more than just, just a, a, a treatment and palliative care, but in, at least in some instances, uh, to offer cures. And, and so I think, I think this is a tremendously exciting time. And it's all built on firstly understanding the, the basic variation within the population and then being able to relate that to disease. And as, as with our last, last talk from uh, Sir John, uh, the information that we can collect through uh, wearable devices and everything else means that in the future, uh, not only will we work with these areas of disease that we're also familiar with, but we will be able to relate our genomics to lifestyle in general, uh, whether that be for a disease or a trait or to be able to try and provide people information, for instance, that will delay the onset of diabetes. If you could delay the onset of diabetes or if you could learn to live with cancer, I think these are the opportunities that are provided and that's tremendously exciting. And do you think there will be a time when everyone is sequenced in a population? I, 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 I think, you know, as the, uh, as the costs of uh, being able to do so and the ability to handle the information uh, come together, uh, that is a possibility. Uh, I, I think the reality, at least in terms of what I see uh, here at the moment, is that we are still somewhat selective rather than working sure. on a population basis. Uh, I think uh, being able to, to target areas where you can have the biggest impact first and then step up yeah. to the next level sense. and the next level uh, makes a lot of sense in the current Very time. Good. Je Jean-Francois, can I ask you, you, you you're starting now with a plan towards a goal within the next five years of achieving in excess of 200,000 genomes a year. Is that a threshold that you think will become the norm? That will happen every year and the, basically more and more of the population will get sequenced? Or is that just a step, a pilot towards something on a larger scale no, ac it, akin it, to the UK? It is just a step because it's 200,000 world genome per year. It's only for rare disease that, to, fit, to fill the name of rare disease and oncology. If we want to target you know, common disease, we'll, go to go, we'll have to go much higher than that. It's probably in the range of million sequence per year. And going back to your equation, I guess, medically speaking, it, it makes absolutely sense to think that you know, each person would have a merit to be sequenced. The problem we'll be facing, so do we have enough you know, genetic counselors and how we will handle this information? You know, when you are not sick, Sequencing can be a problem. When you are in your disease, you just want to get sequenced because you want to have a, a clue to your disease. So it's really changing a lot. So, but yes, you know, the vision should be that uh, sequencing is providing so much information that at some point, each and everyone could, could have access, at least should have access to sequence and decide whether he wants he, he he want to have access or not. Very good. So in a country that hasn't yet started on their endeavors, what would you, what, what has been your key learning in terms of a challenge you weren't anticipating that you would recommend they take notice of? And, may, and maybe also just on the other side, an opportunity that can be capitalized on that, that you could accelerate an agenda towards. Maybe, Jean-Francois, can I ask you yeah, first? Yeah, I guess, you know, first of all, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very timely. So, you know, the one that has not started is not really left behind, you know, you can start now and being at, at, the, at the top of the game in the future because the technology is evolving. And I guess, you know, England, you know, paves the way to do it and thanks, for, thanks England to do that. And I guess we are just following. So it is really timely, timely to do it now. Uh, the advice I would say, and I guess Brian talked about it, depending on the population you want to sequence, you absolutely need to have a reference population. You know, it, you know Arabic samples are not present in database, France either. You know, you might be uh, uh, surprised about it, but when you look at what is available in the 1,000 genome in the UK, in the US, uh, there are very, very few French samples. So we've been sequencing 1,000 people from France, 
And we have much, much better information when we compare our disease patient to this very small sample we get. So this is number one. And, 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 uh, uh, and number two, again, I guess uh, I want to convey a very positive message. It is very, very timely to do it. And I guess at least, you know, at least for France, you know, we are very happy to help anyone that wants to be involved into this business because at some point, with the world in which we live, we will have to share data with, with uh, all together because we have a lot of Arabic people in France, for example, and we have a lot of French people in Dubai and everywhere. So, and, and genomic also opens a new avenue for medicine, what we call in France genomic twins. And at some point in the future, people will be treated just because of their genetic fingerprint. And at some point, it might well be that, you know, I have a patient in France, he has these very specific genomic footprints, which is equivalent to someone in Italy or in Dubai, whatsoever, you know. And, and in the other country, I have a treatment for this guy. And we, by analogy, we might be using just, you know, the, the fact that these people share genomic data just to treat the patient accordingly. So we also need to share data. And the other advice would be prepare to share the data with the rest of the world. Fantastic. Thank you. And Brian, can I ask you the same question? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I would still uh, tend to, to opt for a targeted approach. Uh, I, think, I think it's very sort of clear also that uh, before one starts sequencing, um, it, it shouldn't just be let's sequence because we can. It should be let us sequence because we want to answer certain questions, because we want to make certain impacts. And I think when you, when you look at the health in a population and you look at the problems within the population, let's target the uh, sequencing efforts to solving those particular problems. And I think that's where, uh, you know, what, what happens within the, uh, within the Arab world may be a little bit different to, to what happens in North America or what happens in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I think there are opportunities that uh, as you're able to sequence more, uh, you, you start, start targeting kind of more uh, global groups. Like, for instance, within Saudi Arabia, there are 513,000 newborns each year. You know, is there a possibility of uh, uh, sequencing all of those individuals rather than just doing newborn screening? Uh, what impact will that have in the next uh, 40 or 50 years? Do you really want to be sequencing someone who is uh, 60 or 70 years old where you don't have the benefits of all of that information? The earlier that you have some of this information, maybe uh, this represents the differences that you can make. Uh, you, you have a lot of uh, uh, social and ethical issues to deal with. Do people want to know what their susceptibilities are when they are uh, 12 months old? Or do you want to wait till people are 16, year, 16 years old and can make their own decisions? I think there are a lot of community discussions that need to be, be had. I think some of the things that can happen, though, is within the healthcare service, you know, there, there, there are, is a tremendous amount of information being collected. There are so many medical tests being done. There are samples there. I think biobanking and, and being able to centralize that information, being able to mine that information is extremely important. Uh, the sequencing and the informatics and whatever else are developing, but you need that sample set. You need that kind of clinical picture. You need to understand where your problems are. And I think when you do those, you can actually target your, uh, your genomic efforts to something that is going to translate into better healthcare for the population, uh, not just in 10 years' time, but, but you know, immediately in many cases and gradually in, in, in a lot of the other cases. You know, I, I, I just think there's a tremendous opportunity here and within the Arab world also, as Jean-Francois says, it's extremely important that we share the information. Uh, I think uh, one should leverage the work that has come before. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to simply, uh, to simply repeat that work. Uh, uh, I think sharing of the information, some of the unique population structure within the Arab world even offers opportunities to solve disease for other areas. Uh, I, I think already, you know, the, there are pharmaceutical companies that come to the Arab world that want to look at a lot of the rare diseases that we have here because the lessons learned from rare diseases help in terms of development of treatment for common diseases, so yes. I have a thousand more questions and we could continue for hours, I'm sure, but I'm being given the signal that our time is up. So I'd like to thank Brian, I'd like to thank Jean-Francois for the insights from programs that are live and kicking and, and wish you luck as you, uh, you push the boundaries in your own countries to, uh, to move this agenda forward. Thank you both.